Welcome back to The Couple. Today, I'm joined by a man who needs no introduction, one of the top two mustaches in nuclear advocacy, Mr. Mark Nelson himself. Mark, welcome back to The Couple. Uh, thanks, number two. You cracked up for a second there. Just just uh, repeat your thank you or whatever. Sure. Uh, thank you, number two mustache. <laughs> you were sharp. So, Mark, um, you're here to talk, to give an address even. Uh, we talked about this in our last episode, um, to address the state of the atom. Obviously, there's been um, a real whirlwind, it feels, blowing out there. Um, you know, as someone who's following this along pretty regularly, even I'm surprised by the pace of, of the news items that are coming, um, that are seeming to really shift um, what some people are calling a renaissance, others a revival. Um, I'm curious to hear um, how you would, what, what label you would use to describe the, the heady times that we're in for nuclear. Yeah, well, the easiest thing to do is not to describe it and let people looking back in golden future days describe it by whatever word they use best. I mean, Industrial Revolution wasn't famously was not described as such during the supposed revolution, right? And uh, although a lot of powerful good things were happening for humanity, for a lot of the people in it, it was an unpleasant time. It was a dirty yeah. time <laughs> if you were in the middle of the beast. So, you know, at the moment, I think I just will refuse, and you're going to just have to come up with a nice title for the episode yourself. But I'm not going to call it anything, and that's not because I believe in bad luck or jinx or anything. Just sure, uh, sure. I'm I'm riding the wave, and I'm enjoying it. And we'll hear some of those right. big things that are worth enjoying in the episode. So something is afoot, it is fair to say. Um, something is and afoot. Something is afoot. Um, and I want to I want to echo back to, you know, something did feel like it was a foot before my time in the early 2000s. Um, and maybe we'll reflect a bit on, on those times and how those are different. But first off, let's just zoom in on on the moment we're in the something that we're in right now. What for you is the strongest evidence that something is a foot? For me, it's that in democracies, right and left center and even uh, further than the center wings are becoming pro-nuclear and it's happening as a sort of collapse of you might say a collapse of uh, agreement to not discuss nuclear or a collapse of uh, the existing regime so the existing regime is what either you don't talk about nuclear you don't bring it up if you like it and if you do like it you just push a little to make sure that it's always blocked or banned or off the table or uh, unincluded Part of this is just outside of politics. It extends to the media. What do I mean in the media? It means if you're an editor or a journalist, you don't talk to anyone who's been inside a nuclear plant, who works at a nuclear plant, who understands nuclear engineering. You don't talk to anyone who likes nuclear. You specifically avoid it. And if you do talk to them, you make sure to frame them as an outlier industry view or a, uh, you know, a co corrupted, compromised view. Now we're seeing almost a complete inversion. A suspicion of those sources who are exactly against, as much against nuclear now as they have always been, even though many of the journalists doing the hard work of reporting stories feel themselves this nuclear moment and they, they are sympathetic to nuclear energy, they're certainly curious. So with the breakdown of that consensus, not to say anything on nuclear, there could either be a giant battle breakout where uh, pro-nuclear and anti-nuclear clash in titanic fashion. We're not really seeing that, Chris. What we're seeing is that the, the anti-nuclear forces were a paper tiger. Now, we'll discuss more of this later. None of that means we'll build nuclear really well in the West. What it does mean is that the things that are not the nuclear industry's either direct fault or under its control, like public sentiment or the laws on the books, for example, those are changing rapidly like ice crumbling and breaking with the coming of spring. And I'm not sure any of us thought that would happen, especially within the context of a, a scary Ukraine war with a capture of nuclear plant in battle. Right, right. yeah. So <clears throat> big discursive changes. Um, and what are those resulting in? I mean, I, there was news uh, you, you tweeted yesterday about an exciting announcement coming out of the UK, but let's, let's cover a few of the kind of objective changes in reality, not just the discourse. Or perhaps sure. so, what's, what's resulting from this change in discourse. The UK has been cautiously and less cautiously pro-nuclear since Fukushima Daiichi. There's a overwhelmingly, you might say, positive story for nuclear that came out in the British press 
around the calm, science-based response to Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns, triple meltdowns, and you had leading science communicators, nonpartisan, trusted by all sides, go out and say, actually, this reveals that nuclear is pretty safe because we're seeing this widespread devastation, a basically worst-case possible scenario, especially when you consider the the age of the reactors and the state of uh, Japanese safety regulator, and no one died from radiation, no one got a radiation burn, and we should probably be ready to not evacuate as much if something happens to us here. So that was the response. It was one of the few countries in the world that rapidly recovered in terms of public sentiment for nuclear, and somehow all of that turned into only a single nuclear plant starting up and more shutting down because they were just getting old and there wasn't consensus on how best to subsidize the up the life extensions necessary to keep their older plants going. So we had, what, 11, 10, 12 years of semi-wasted time in some ways, while public sentiment to nuclear kept going up. The Labor Party grudgingly became uh, pro-nuclear and was willing to say it. Um, I mean, Labor government before this one, so back with Tony Blair, it was pretty positive towards nuclear eventually. But it was still this thing where each side wasn't sure whether they should say something about it in order to position themselves against the opposition. And it it was just this kind of game where the public was pro-nuclear and all the politicians you could ever talk to were more privately pro-nuclear than the, the things they would say or the things they would do. So a lot of froth and not enough action. And then some big setbacks, like having the chance to take the lead in financial regulation along uh say, well, you know, London's one of the great financial centers in the world. So if London came out and said, actually, we consider nuclear as sustainable as renewables, if that had happened five, six years ago, we could see a different world now. Now, I'm not complaining. The news we saw last night was a government, sitting government, finally declaring in a budget, we will say that nuclear is sustainable. And I saw some critics online saying, oh, you think just by saying it, you make it. No, that's the opposite of the problem. Nuclear actually was sustainable, in many cases more sustainable than a non-nuclear alternative made with renewables, but we weren't willing to say it. So this is a correcting of a mm, tacit falsehood, shall we say, an unstated falsehood that nuclear isn't sustainable. And the UK finally came out and said, we're going to pass a budget that states nuclear is sustainable and gives it the same financial advantages as, re- as renewable. And that's a nearly direct quote from uh, the chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. So uh, B.F. Randall's talked about this recently. I- I've chatted about a little bit it, uh, as well, this idea that nuclear doesn't have a strong constituency. Um, B.F. points out that, you know, because so little um, materials are required for a nuclear plant because uranium is pretty damn cheap. Um, there's not the same kind of industrial financial interests in nuclear, um, you know, in, in the way that there are for, you know, fossil fuels or for renewables, for instance. Um, you know, I've, I've been saying recently that, you know, one of nuclear's constituencies is simply the physics and physics has imposed some hardships on Europe uh, this last year. Um, nuclear tends to thrive um, when fossil fuels are constrained, when prices are high, when energy security is is a real issue. If for you, is that what's the major driver for this change in the discourse and some of the um, exciting prospects we're seeing ahead? If you'll allow me to be a little cute, I think nuclear does have a uh, natural constituency. And here's what I mean. So um, people who believe that there's something out there, something to be hopeful for, oftentimes they will be hopeful until they find the thing that justifies that hope. It's just, uh, you know, it's just in their nature. I'm kind of like that. Um, I I think there will will always be a next step for whatever you're trying to achieve, whatever I'm trying to achieve. There's always a next thing to do. There's some next best option. Even if it's uh, many evils, you can find the, the... the lesser of the two evils, right? And even that that feels optimistic to me. Well, I think that's part of the reason I fell into nuclear so hard and fast within minutes of discovering it as a meme tech on, on internet forums 10 years ago. Uh, I, I make no apologies for how quickly I be, went from nuclear agnostic to I love this and I want to de- dedicate my career to it. So nuclear keeps gathering up people like that in all industries. I gave a speech in Dallas a few weeks ago. Uh, Robert Bryce uh, interviewed me on stage and had some really tough questions. Honestly, the questions that would have prepared me to answer the state of the atom today. 
And what I discovered is these oil company execs, oil and gas bankers, um, oil and gas regulators, all the people that were at this energy event, they all wanted to come up and say, I really love nuclear. Or, you know, only two years ago, I was still scared of it. But now I, I really feel optimism when I see you talk about nuclear and I, I feel it myself. I love it. I'm going to discover more. And I've since talked to a few oil and gas companies that are eager to find out if they've misappraised nuclear sentiment. And not necessarily the way you would think, Chris. In some cases, they were too optimistic on nuclear and then feel what they got wrong is that the public is too set against it. And I said, actually, gentlemen, it's going to be probably the opposite. The public is becoming uh, very excited about nuclear. It's that we're just not quite ready or we have not been ready to deliver. It's like a giant machine spinning up to get the people, the talent, the, the talent in both the finance and the project management and the design and the operation, all of those are different talent spheres. The craft labor talent, uh, even if you try to reduce it with new designs, you're going to need people optimistic that they can do a great job in a timely fashion and committed to doing it like almost people of a common faith. I know that sounds maybe unrealistic to ask for that, but we've had it before. We've delivered. There are going to be fleets around the world from the pr first great age of nuclear optimism that will going, the plants, even the machines themselves in some cases are going to be running in near perpetuity because of that early optimistic stage where everybody assumed that they were going to get the job done and get it done well, and then they did. That's what's being <laughs> gathered up again for nuclear, those optimists. Now, where do those optimists in that constituency play into what I'm seeing now where there's a crisis and suddenly you discover a lot more optimists for nuclear? Well, partly it's because there's so much more pessimism for other options. I, that is that entirely positive? I don't know, but nuclear is the beneficiary. So what I mean by that is uh, say solar and wind are not novel anymore. They have to stand on their achievements. In some cases, they are. In many places, it's there's a solar and wind building machine that you might call it that group of talented optimists who continue to expand solar and wind, uh, maybe not at record rates, but in absolute magnitude, you're going to see charts all summer showing that wind and solar production, if you add them together, are more than nuclear production in the world. And people are going to say record breaking growth rates. Nuclear never grew energy by this amount this fast, depending on the country, the region, there'll be different ways to mess around with data both on the wind and solar side and on the nuclear side. But what they will all show is that wind and solar is producing more energy now when added up than nuclear. Yet, that doth fund no projects. Like, that doesn't justify the fact that oh, added up over the world, projects that were you know, planned a few years ago and are now being executed does not guarantee, and we know this is in nuclear as well as any place, does not guarantee that the next wave of projects makes financial, environmental, or social sense. We've lived this. We've lived this nightmare in nuclear, where we saw a huge wave of nuclear plants planned that would just start dominating the world energy mix in the 80s. And then it didn't happen, even though the existing plants were starting to come online and do a decent job. Maybe not an amazing job, but so. The pessimism around other options losing their almost euphoria, and offshore wind is a huge one here that we might speak about briefly before returning to nuclear, that has led optimists to seek new grounds. And for those talented people who I hear interested in nuclear for the very first time, what I tell them is, we've been waiting for you. We do think you're talented. And nuclear is an amazing physical technology that has not been built with our best in recent years. We've been short on people and short on hope. You know, it's, it's interesting in my, my backyard here in Ontario, um, I'm, I'm saying it's the best equipped jurisdiction in the Western world to, to get going on, on new nuclear. Um, the talk has been limited to SMRs for, for quite a few years, and now large nuclear is back on the table. And that's very much the case because um, we have some pretty solid um, forecasts of increasing demand. And, and that's not just driven by climate, because let's face it, as much as politicians like to do a bit of virtue signaling, they seldom make you know, expensive decisions purely on the basis of climate. It has to do with you know, increases in immigration and reshoring of industry, et cetera. 
Um, and that seems to be really the key driver in my read of why, you know, new nuclear, new large nuclear is back on the table. Um, you know, I was actually reassured to hear that it wasn't purely because of climate that that demand was happening because that really makes me feel that new nuclear will get built. Um, but do you feel like that's a major factor or is it just, you know, is, is it that the demand that was being provided by fossil fuels is, is less easy to, to provide now with, with skyrocketing prices or just physical limits, um, as much of the world is facing or, you know, with Russian, uh, supply cutoffs, et cetera. I think the, uh, the slight return to coal, I don't want to overplay the return to coal in the West and in developed countries because people aren't exactly building new plants. They're more say, extending others longer and switching more gas out when gas is too expensive for more coal. Um, but in the developing world, there's been a brutal shock. Call it the first great toxic awakening to the, to the, to the LNG environment, the liquefied natural gas environment where other countries, no matter how much they pledge themselves for climate, can sweep that all away and outbid you for fuel supplies unless you're doing coal. Doesn't mean you're perfectly insulated, from issues in coal, but you're more insulated than you are with liquefied natural gas. And you cannot bet on that. You cannot bet your economy on LNG when you're dealing with actors like Germany who have the wealth to be the most lethal hypocrites in the world. They can, they can say anything and then they're, they're rich enough to do anything at your cost if you're in, on the same LNG markets as Germany is now involved in right so in pakistan is probably the poster child i think of that that's process, part of the right? sure but that's part of the pessimism that is indeed squeezing people towards nuclear so right. then the you could call it the optimism of return to demand growth i think there was a very slow difficult education period where a lot of people who came into climate thinking and only learned about energy and maybe a little bit of engineering afterwards have slowly come to the cl conclusion that wait we started this thinking we would say use less energy, but then we say that we want to electrify everything, but that means we need more electricity. And you can just see people slowly work out in their heads that they need more electricity regardless of how much energy they have. And then they join this crowd that realizes, wait, if we need more energy and it need, if we need more electricity regardless of energy growth, what makes a lot of electricity and where are the places that have done it? Well, people are rediscovering nuclear, you might call it through the back way. And it's it's really happening. And Ontario is a great example where you you and I both know three years ago, we're like, how do we gin up interest in more can do's? And you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. There was no force in the world powerful enough to make those who sell can do's sell can do's. They just wouldn't do it. They wouldn't talk to you. They weren't. They didn't show up at conferences. They wouldn't. It was just completely useless. You remember these days. Um, and I and the higher the higher demand growth in the West is going to be one of those things that's very powerful because that drove the first nuclear era. I think the issue on climate is that climate truly unites optimists and pessimists in a kind of a toxic brew that often doesn't get progress. Because the pessimists can be in burn it down mode or why bother. And if they're some of the loudest speakers and leaders in climate, you have the climate doomers. You can't, you can't get anything done with climate doomers. They're not there to do something. They're there because it's easy to scare. But with the climate optimists, you might say, they're naturally just coming straight into the pro-nuclear camp. I've, I, one of the most beautiful types of cooperation you see nowadays is people who moderate their views on climate change not being an issue in order to work with their colleagues who are moderating their views on nuclear being a problem in order to work on climate change. And they all find that as long as they just talk about nuclear, they want the same things and can move in the same direction. That's the thing for me in 2023. So let's, let's talk, um, I guess maybe regionally, um, you know, we've covered this sector for the duration of this podcast um, in terms of where things are actually happening. Um, you know, it's exciting to see Vogel, I'm not sure if it's grid connected or they're just doing hot functional testing. You can give us the more technical no, 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 update no. on that. They are turning up the power day for day. I, in fact, okay. uh, as you finish that question, I'm just going to check to see what today's report from the NRC said they got to yesterday power level wise. But two days ago, it was at 18%. So by the time this podcast is out, we should be counting on Vogel 3 being connected to the grid, 
which is a it's a really powerful moment for what comes next in nuclear. And I think it's going to surprise a lot of people who had a let's say a pessimistic view on LMRs, that's large modular reactors like Vogel. Well, I mean, yeah, you've you've planted the seed there. Let's All right. So that. here's the thing: Vogel, uh, by the standards of say Vogel one and two back in the 80s, or by a lot of American nuclear plants back in the 80s, got built on time and on budget by the standards of the of the of the plant construction catastrophes that helped kill off the first great nuclear era. Yeah. So what do I mean by that? You look at, say, some of the best performing nuclear plants in the world in terms of cost and, and online time are in Texas. Those damn things took between 10 and 19 years to come online. So Vogel at, at uh, 11, using the same metric, I, I hear Simon Holmes Accord in my head saying, no, 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 you have to start the pre-construction period. Well, for now, using the IAEA metric of nuclear-grade safety-related concrete going in under the future core all the way to the commissioning, commercial commissioning time, um, what we're going to see in Vogel is going to be about um, 11 and a half years, which is not acceptable. It's not good enough. And it's not as bad as it was for plants that are now cornerstones of their industrial societies. So that's not to try to say, hey, bankers, don't worry. You might all lose your shirt, but those who come right after you and buy the plant or take ownership of the power, they're going to do okay. Now, like I said, that's not good enough. However, considering the disadvantages of Vogel, that is starting without a completed set of blueprints, basically, designs for the for the people who are building. There were designs available for the regulator, but guess how many nuclear plants the NRC builds? None. They don't build nuclear plants. You can give NRC whatever designs you want, and it doesn't tell you how to pour concrete on the job site. It doesn't tell you where to put things on the job site. Those are a different set of designs, and those weren't done. Here's another thing. Any AP1000s that Westinghouse moves forward with from this point on will have lots of reference designs to work off of. Uh, they will have learned a very powerful lesson about modules, which is modules done poorly are probably worse than no modules at all. That was a very powerful lesson because people can get a little too high on their own supply, both small and large modular reactors, when you start talking modules. Um, you, you know, that's one of the keywords. When I hear people very new to nuclear, they've heard about nuclear and they say, I've heard there are modules. And I'm like, yeah, I've heard about them too. A little too much. Well, <laughs> modularity done wrong at any size level will be something that makes new Vogels. And modularity done right is what will make new Kashiwazaki Kariwas. That's uh, KK6 and KK7 in Japan in the 70s, large modular reactors built in modules in three and a half years from concrete pour to online. Yeah, uh, those are the world record holders, I think. Right? right? And that was yeah. large modular reactors with the modules done properly with highly experienced teams building the sixth and seventh reactor almost continuously at the same site. I've heard stories of grandfathers working with grandsons on the same work site. We, we can't get back there until we're building again and starting large modular constructions with a supply chain in place from day one with young people who cut their teeth in the catastrophes of the 2010s at Vogel in place with leadership at Westinghouse in place that fully understands, if they, if they take into account these lessons, fully understands those lessons. And then owners who go in with clear eyes about what went wrong at Vogel and a determination not to repeat it. If those folks, if those folks want to deep dive that topic, there is a decouple episode literally titled What Went Wrong at Vogel. Um, it's quite a ways back in the archive, but definitely worth a listen. Um, so Vogel's come online. Oikoloto, I can never pronounce Finnish names properly. Um, They're got, still having troubles with pumps. We're seeing a very yeah. interesting thing with Siemens. It feels like when Siemens got out of nuclear, their ability to deliver big, complicated things um, for power plants just started crashing. And just their, they're just, I don't know, their heart and soul seem to rot. From my point of view, looking at nuclear plants that use big Siemens pumps. Um, it's just they're having endless problems with their equipment. And that was a major issue for Diablo Canyon. It still remains one of the issues. I see people critiquing Diablo for having a bad year a few years recently. That's Siemens' fault. They've made crappy equipment. And I think that when you 
nuclear is almost always the most complicated and prestigious and elite part of any company. It's the most prestigious part of any utility. If they have nuclear. It's the most prestigious part of any supplier. If they do nuclear grade business, in some ways you regret it because you're like, ah, it makes everything expensive and complicated. In other ways, you say, no, we are capable of this level of excellence if we put our hearts and minds into it. Well, Siemens is. Pumps and old Kyoto continue to have issues. That's what I'm hearing, and we'll see if they can stay up because we we could sure use the power in Europe. And uh, for me, the question is: Are German companies going to return to nuclear with the turnaround and sentiment of nuclear in Germany? Because New- Germany is the industrial heart of Europe. Because it's at this point, it's obvious whatever happens to Germany, the countries surrounding Germany. Are going to go all into nuclear. So if German companies decide to get back into nuclear and do it well, uh, hopefully we can come out of this slump of, that we're seeing from Siemens providing, as far as I can tell, crappy equipment or crappy service. I'm not in, inside in OK Lyoto. I wish I could get the full story. Well, pivoting over to Europe, um, I you know I've, I've been saying prematurely, I think, that we were at the end of the era of fighting to save nuclear plants and the agenda was now and the struggle was now to get new nuclear plants built. Um, we have seen some plants come offline, um, you know, outside of Europe in Taiwan the other day. Um, we saw, I believe, Dwell, one of the Dwell units come offline. The Germans look like, does it look like we're going to lose the last three? What's what's your take? They're certainly going to turn off on April 15th. The fuel that would be needed and could probably be obtained in a matter of months, it hasn't been obtained. So the reactivity is lowering. You can see on charts of nuclear electricity production in Germany, it's tapering off. So they're in the so-called run-out operations that we have uh, introduced listeners of this podcast to in the past, where the the core is going lower and lower power without turning off yet. That turnoff point is going to be April 15th, uh, assuming there's no unplanned shutdowns uh, close to then, at which point there probably wouldn't be enough reactivity in the core to bring it back online and overcome Xeon buildup. So yeah, April 15th is the shutdown point at which time you will enter a probably multi-year period of the plants being weeks away from restarting at any given point. And that would make five total nuclear plants in Germany that are weeks away from restarting. And they'll just sit there with 10 million people's worth of power just not being produced, yet not being torn apart. By law, you have to get permission to do anything at the nuclear plant that's irreversible. And two of the three plants that have shut down recently have not received that. And the third, by most recent accounts that I've heard, although they've done more decommissioning activities, they could bring it back. So that let's talk about six. Six of the largest reactors, six of the most prolific nuclear reactors on planet Earth, just waiting to come back. But we're going to get some really ugly charts from Germany where they're going to have another increase in carbon emissions at minimum in relative terms to surrounding countries, probably depending on if they get lucky with November, December winds. If if winds don't come in heavy across the continent in November, December, we're likely to see another year. This would be the third year in a row after the 2020 uh, minimum of increasing carbon emissions. Well, your optimist credentials are impeccable there with that description of uh, the German situation. Let's pivot over to hey, France. Though, wait, wait, wait. It is optimistic because um, it means they're feeding and clothing and housing oh, and powering their people. Like, <clears throat> that's good. We just would prefer them do it without the pollution and the cost of the fossil fuels they have to import to do so. I was speaking about your optimism of the, the five plants being ready to come back in a few weeks. Uh, but let's let's, right. let's so pivot the, to France. That is optimism, yeah. You, Absolutely. Absolutely. It's purest form. Um, let's pivot to France. I think uh, this is a, a country with an absolutely massive turnaround. There was a legislated, legislated plan to reduce their share of nuclear electricity from 75 to 50 percent. On what grounds? I don't think any of us were entirely clear. They don't know um, either. There was a parliamentary inquiry. A great French nuclear inquisition is going on. And I could not be more thrilled where they're pulling up the people who made like that target, the 75 to 50, and they're asking them, how'd you decide on that? And they're saying, uh, we don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And here's what's so insidious, Chris, about a 75 to 50% target. It's that 
because nuclear was the backbone of their entire economy, their only truly indigenous energy source besides a bit of hydro, well, it means that it cratered energy availability across the economy, which means that energy supplies shrink. So you have to keep producing less to hit your target of reduction. So let's say you make 500 terawatt hours of power, and and of that, 400 is nuclear. That's 80%. That's too high. Your law says it needs to be 50%. Chris, does that mean you have to get down to 250? No, because at 250, you've cratered your economy so much, you may only need 300 terawatt hours of electricity, at which point, 150, at which point you're importing. So they, here's the other thing. They were not going to meet that target for reducing nuclear, except that their reductions in staffing, reductions in in maintenance budgets, reductions in capabilities, reductions in just the focus of their of their elite officials all of that was crashing at the same time so that systematic problems that came up across their fleet were, were just they just had to shut all their reactors down and and they were not ready to power their country when Russia shut off the gas pipelines they weren't ready to power Europe they're producing i would say about half the power their fleet ought to produce if carefully shepherded if treated as the spectacular resources is. So although the law was in place until, what, two or three days ago, the French were only hitting that law due to sheer incompetence. And maybe a little bit of bad luck, but look, you make, you you get the luck you deserve in some ways, and nuclear plants in America get bad luck, and that means some years, one of the 99 reactors will have a 70 or 80% uptime. That's bad luck, or it's bad man, or whatever you want to call it. The problem is across France, you have 70 or 80 percent built in as the expectation, and then they undershot that by a significant amount. And with the repealing of this law in that way, it's a huge symbolic victory that says we were stupid to even attempt this. The people who did this are somewhere between uh, morons and and uh, sabotagers, intentional sabotagers of our economy. Right. And then with that discrediting and that public process of airing out this dirty laundry of these foolish people who had no idea what they were doing, didn't even know how energy worked or where it came from, and were put in charge of the energy supply and just fumbled around and messed it up, that is hopefully going to convince a younger, angry generation to do a better job with nuclear in the future. In fact, that's what built the nuclear fleet in the first place, Chris. Uh, An entire generation of young, angry men saw what their fathers had done collaborating with Germany and they themselves were the elite officials of the, of the new France. They were the ones who had not collaborated. They were the ones who had fought in the resistance or fought with Charles de Gaulle and had somehow acquitted themselves with extreme bravery and courage and competence. Those were the generations that built the reactor fleet to never be subjugated again. And I think we're just going to have to have that pattern. The people who collaborated with Germany to destroy their own energy supply, but without the competency of the Germans, the ruthlessness of the Germans, or the, um, quite frankly, the fossil fuels of the Germans with the lignite mines, uh, those people are going to get publicly humiliated and discredited. And then whoever says the opposite and says we need to bring back nuclear, they're going to be the the new leaders. That's optimism on my part because it's a really hard thing to regain excellence. So hard. Harder sure. maybe than getting it in the first place, Chris. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and you think about the Mesmer plan and you think about what the global prospects are for any country doing anything similar um, in the next coming decades. I think that's that's quite daunting. The preconditions have, have changed a lot, particularly in the West with deindustrialization. Just as we do this kind of nuclear tour, um, we're not going to be able to touch on every region in the world. Um, you've hinted a little bit about, I think, prospects in the developing world as they've experienced being locked out of LNG markets. Anywhere else that you think we should we should touch on? We've got episodes, of course, on the Russian atom. This was prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but still very interesting given to being such a big player in the global nuclear exports sphere. Um, we haven't personally, you and I talked about China, but we've covered that before. Any other, any other regions that are worth, you know, really paying attention to, or that are illustrative of whatever we're calling this, this revival, this something happening. Sure. Let's do a quick hit. So Russian nuclear projects are, as far as I can tell, continuing rapidly around the world, which is something that experts disagreed on 
at the start of the war? Would this destroy Russia's ability to keep their construction sites going? And I was torn. I didn't know, and I didn't have a way to judge. Turns out the construction sites are going. Uh, Rose Adam just hit a <laughs> hit 45 days before their goal, I believe was the number, on finishing up the concrete at the top of the reactor domes in Bangladesh for Rupor. That plan is going to start up really soon and is going to change the energy future of Bangladesh. And that's a real hope over pessimism story because there's a lot of people who for, I don't know, Malthusian reasons, racism reasons or whatever, think that Bangladesh is just hopeless and just 100 million people need to die or migrate to prove that we can't do anything about climate change. And instead, they're like, why don't we build a really tough nuclear plant and make sure that that provides a solid base of power that benefits our economy, and then we'll expand nuclear from there and, and stabilize our supply in the face of rising seas. Because the nuclear plant is always worth protecting from the sea as long as you build a high enough seawall. But now everybody knows that thanks to Fukushima Daiichi. So that's an example of a project that you might have thought could slow down, but didn't with the Russian and full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So those projects continue apace. And the big ones are in Turkey and Egypt, and um, they're also building in Iran, and they're building in uh, India, and they're completing some uh, reactors in China. I haven't heard much about the progress within Russia, but it's a little bit harder to get information out. Um, so that's the Russian world. U.S. has finally woken up to this, that we don't have a competitive offer in a lot of cases, but Eastern Europe wants us to build nuclear. Hopefully we get up to speed and with a combination of, say, CANDUs or AP-1000s or Korean designs, we can provide reactors for an Eastern Europe that previously was just going to get Russian reactors. So Korea seems to be the most um, credible uh <laughs> exporter developer to the West, like excluding if you're going to, if you're not going to include Rosatom or, or I don't think Chinese have really entered into the export market yet. Uh, but the Koreans obviously pulled off uh, something quite impressive uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and then they dropped the ball, Chris. They exactly. So they've had, they've an had ideological had a, warrior, anti-nuclear president who yes. also understood nothing about energy. All he knew is that he wanted to destroy what was Korea's greatest and most prestigious industry at the time. So let's talk about that turnaround and also what the prospects, perhaps limitations are. I mean, the Koreans, it's a small country. They can only do so much. There's a real hunger. A number of countries, uh, Poland included, are, are in talks uh, for new APR 1400s. If I was a country coming to nuclear, I would be talking to the South Koreans myself. Um, tell us a little bit about the saga of that of that turnaround um, and how, how, how much demand you think that the Koreans can meet. In brief, and this is probably worth its whole episode. In brief, uh, Korea, South Korea was determined to make an independent nuclear energy supply and supply chain. So they sampled reactors from around the world. Uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they got reactors from France. They got reactors from America. They got uh, reactors from Canada. So they had a sort of a reactor zoo going to see whether they would should choose one direction over another. They ended up going with an American company that was pessimistic and thought that they were going to probably go out of business anyway in 1980, uh, you know, in the 1980s with, with uh, Chernobyl blowing up in 86, they just did not think that they had a way forward. And so they made an exceptionally compelling offer. This is combustion engineering, made a very compelling offer to the Koreans with essentially total technology transfer. That set the seeds of the current impasse at the moment between Westinghouse and Korea because Westinghouse absorbed combustion engineering and Korea was convinced that they had totally independent IP that they could export uh, with their agreement with combustion engineering. So this sort of started boiling over with the United Arab Emirates deal where um, Korea put together an exceptionally compelling offer that included a leadership role for Korea and a subsidiary role for Westinghouse to supply equipment services. So these APR 1400s, Advanced Pressurized Water Reactor 1400s of Korean design, but very tight lineage from American designs were sold and can, are being finished up now in UAE. By the time COP28 rolls around, climate conference rolls around, and uh, later this year, we expect to see all four of those gorgeous APR 1400s running, closely resembling those in the desert in 
uh, Arizona at Palo Verde nuclear plant, the last combustion engineering plant to come on in the United States. So what's the issue? The issue is Westinghouse says, we know that you're using our IP in ways that are not in the agreement, the transfer agreement. Westinghouse or Korea then says, no, this is ours through and clear. We're the project leaders. We own this IP. We developed this reactor. It's Korea now. We should be able to sell. Both sides are going to want a really quick, fair outcome. Both sides think that fair means, say, Westinghouse in the lead or Korea in the lead. I'm not in a position to adjudicate. I'm just very hopeful that it will be worked out quite soon. And then Korea will do what Korea does best. Westinghouse will provide what Westinghouse currently provides really well and may get more capabilities of delivering big plants on time. And they're going to find ways to divide up a big market that certainly has enough work for everybody so between Poland, um, the Middle East, um, Central, Central European countries also like Czechia. And all of this back and forth on the large modular reactors is taking place sort of at the very highest levels of state, of commerce, uh, while at the same time, there's this sort of people's revival in some ways of SMRs at the bottom, where individual businessmen and leaders get so enamored by the vision of a small reactor project that's right size for their community or for their business or their trading hub. They, they see that as something they can deliver with their own power, with their own resources in their own time. And so SMRs are getting a large number of entities involved in, in nuclear that would not if there were only large modular reactors. And then the large modular reactor folks are like these colossal titans striding above it all with you know Poland ordering half a dozen at a time, for example, of AP1000s. We hope to see the final contracts to that very soon. We've seen a lot of great stuff unveiled, and I think that we're going to see AP1000 successfully built in a reasonable period of time in Poland. But it's happening at the same time that Poland has business leaders super excited, justifiably, about various SMR designs, and there may be some simultaneous work going on. We'll see. It's, it's tricky to see it happening in a country that does not yet have any nuclear. It's not maybe impossible. In fact, it's maybe necessary, but that doesn't prove that it's going to happen or that we're going to uh, not have log jams at the regulatory level or at the financing level or at the talent level on the projects. There may be bidding wars between different nuclear projects for talent. You could only hope that that would be uh, balanced by a massive draw of people and ideas and abilities into the competing projects. But we're yet to see. So Mark, what, what new nuclear country are you most bullish on and why? So what country has no nuclear do I think is going to do nuclear well? Um, quite honestly, I see Saudi Arabia in a position to see the outstanding success of UAE's program and to say, we want one of those and we have the cash to buy it. I don't know who they're going to go with. I know they've solicited, it's been made public, they've, they've received, uh, they solicited bids for their, their program. And I think at the point that they do it, they're going to have the best people on planet Earth appointed to deliver the project. And they're not even going in, say, blind, shall we say. They're going in knowing what's possible in a nearby country with very similar circumstances. And I think they're going to do a spectacular job. And I don't know what that means for the region. I don't know whether that means other nearby countries are going to have to get nuclear or fall behind. But I suspect that it will shock the world of traditional energy when the scale of their plans are announced. We'll see, though. I, we won't know until later this year, I suspect. Uh, in the developing world, though, I'm paying attention to, uh, say, Southeast Asian countries. I visited the Philippines um, a number of months ago and was interested to see that nuclear had gone from a sort of forbidden topic or a topic for loonies to a fascinating thing that was on everybody's mind and it was just had taken over the I ideas realm and energy for that country. So the president had visited an SMR company and on his first tour back to America. And that was the talk of the town when I was in Manila. Everybody wanted to talk about modular reactors and people who had been talking about nuclear for 
years, like Congressman Mark Kowanko, you know, one of our movement leaders, he went from being an outsider, weirdo, kept going on about all this nuclear stuff. And people were like, how weird you are. Nobody else is going on about this. Why are you keep talking about it? Now he's seen as like a um, for, uh, long-sighted visionary instead of a weirdo who's keeps going, banging on about the technology nobody wants. Now people are like, hey, wasn't that Mark Kowanko guy, wasn't he going on about nuclear a long time ago? And that pattern, to some degree, is repeating in other countries where a few people were interested in nuclear way before. They were too early, which is, as I like to say, very close to being wrong. And those people are then looked at as farsighted now that the conversation has turned towards nuclear. So Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian nations have hundreds of millions of people in population. Philippines is what, number... 11, 12 in the world in population with over 100 million people. And for any one of those countries to make a really strong positive step towards nuclear, and I expect you'll hear news from the Philippines soon on this, you can expect to see a very serious approach taken at double time in all the surrounding nations because none of them want to be left behind. So, and Mark, as we were alluding to at the beginning of the episode, um, there's been talk of renaissances before. Um, I mean, countries like Nigeria were talking at, with the with the Russians, I believe, about building four gigawatts of nuclear. Um, there was a similar um, situation in South Africa. They were talking about 12 gigawatts, I think, of nuclear uh, in the early 2000s. Um, I was just looking through some uh, Obama-era communications about, um, you know, Republican senators uh, you know, and, and a kind of compromise once uh, Obama swept the House, the Senate, and uh, and the Congress around around pursuing climate action with nuclear. I mean, we've had these kind of heady times before. Um, could this all fizzle? Do you think there's something that's that's uh, different about the moment that we're in compared to say 20 years ago? Here's the thing, Chris: the crazy energy prices and the shut off of some of the largest fossil fuel infrastructure in the world intentionally against economic good sense has shown people that energy is so important it resides outside of just economics or just business. Germany was so damn sure that their almighty euro reserves would just force Germany to have to go begging to the person providing the money when, of course, Russia was playing the Bain role here saying, you're paying us money and you think that gives you power over us? No, you're paying tribute to us and we're providing you the fuel you need to survive if we choose to and we now choose not to. That, that put energy on a completely different footing. That was the conversation in Dallas among the leaders of the fossil fuel industry. The realization that it wasn't only about price and that price today guaranteed you nothing about tomorrow, no matter what the forward curves say, no matter what the futures say that somebody can choose to turn off the pipes. And in a world where somebody just chooses to turn off the biggest pipes in the world, all bets are off. And in a world where all bets were not off, bets were on, and nuclear was sort of excluded, that was a, that was a very stable anti-nuclear situation in finance, industry, and government, even as the popular sentiment, because of leaders like you, kept improving for nuclear. Because the fearful generation whose problem was to stop growth and to stop building and to stop nuclear, that generation is fading away. So there were population reasons, there were cultural reasons why nuclear was rising, and yet it had not broken through into the, uh, you might say, the boardrooms and the uh, cabinet rooms the way it has once somebody proved that no matter how much they ever turn on the pipelines in the future, they could turn them off in a day should they choose to. That. I think that's what's changed from the last year. And it means that with the nuclear plants that already exist lasting longer and longer and longer and longer, it means you start getting a little greedy and you look at you look at Vogel coming on and you think, okay, so now it's going to last for maybe a century. The public isn't against it. The South loves nuclear, if you're talking Southeastern US. It was over budget, but maybe I could do it. And once you build nuclear, nothing performs like nuclear. I think we're also seeing that the big energy source for a bunch of rich northern countries, you know, far north, too far north for, shall we say, baseload solar to help out in the winter, the offshore wind industry in New England is not, things are not 
amazing there. And the rate at which offshore wind is making enemies of former allies in state houses is astonishing to me. It blows my mind. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. And I'm trying to compare and see if the same thing happened in nuclear, where nuclear companies broke their word and showed up as shady foreigners, uh, cheating uh, rude politicians from both parties. Like that's the mood in the state houses in New England. I don't know if they're going to come back from that uh, and provide some bulk answer for, say, a place like New England, densely populated, kind of like a bit of Europe, right? A little cut off from pipelines that they won't allow to bring in the fossil fuels they need and dependent on burning oil in the winter. Like it's just not, it's, it's not a great situation if you can't build out the wind you built your energy plans around in the last five years. So are they going to turn around and build energy plans? Are, are, is the rich world going to turn energy planning towards nuclear? Well, there's a dam that has to break. And that is that almost all the energy modeling groups, partly because they take their cues from who orders their modeling, they seem to intentionally limit nuclear a lot of times by including either unfavorable projections or overly rosy projections for other struggling macro energies like offshore wind. And that ends up locking nuclear out of future energy planning now. I think we're going to see that break and change. And there's going to be more energy modeling groups that say, well, since we know it's wrong, maybe we should just show that our model does include nuclear and just holds tight if they tell us don't include it for political reasons. Well, there's going to be less people asking them to exclude nuclear for political reasons. It may not be a, an explicit thing, but once rich country energy models start including nuclear frequently, I think that combined with what the news we're seeing out of London where they're saying nuclear is sustainable, that's going to help unlock international financing that will provide options for the developing world like Nigeria and South Africa in addition to what the Russians are already offering. At that point, the great nuclear race is on. And as opposed to other great infrastructure development races, I think history shows that a nuclear program is astonishingly beneficial to whatever developing country gets it. Certainly one of the one of the few things working extremely well these days in South Africa is the French nuclear reactors built um, back in the 80s. So yeah, I think the rich countries will end up moving towards nuclear in ways that unlock Western capabilities and finance for developing countries in ways that cement both reactors from Russia, China, and the West all competing for a market that ought to be big enough for everybody. So that's my state of the nuclear in 2023. In the West, not much has been built uh, in several decades. It feels like the lid's been held tightly on the can. Um, and inside that can, there's been a lot of people who have been thinking about how best to move forward, how to deploy nuclear under really challenging circumstances. Those circumstances are becoming less challenging, but there are a plethora of ideas, a plethora of different um, ways to use the technology. I know you don't like terming, you know, the generation terms, um, but also, you know, sizes, degrees of modularization. There's a lot of controversy. So how do you see those controversies playing out in the last little while? Our first episode together was on um, nuclear, uh, real versus imagined. Um, that was a real classic. Um, but let's let's revisit not just that topic, but this idea of you know the plethora of different ups. Uh, you know uh, what am I trying to say here? Startups um, and other entities that are vying for this vision of what nuclear should look like going forward. Now that the opportunity to build is potentially starting to emerge. We're seeing examples of what that looks like here in Ontario, the West first SMR, at least the beginning of the site preparation. That's a very conservative, you know, 10th iteration of a boiling water reactor. Um, what is your general sense of, of how things are going to move as the potential to build actually becomes a reality? I think I keep a lot of my conclusions in place from that. My first podcast ever, not just first with Decouple, the first time I ever did a podcast. Um, at the time, I'd never heard podcasts. I'd never spoken in one. Now I haven't heard them, and now I've spoken in many, many dozens. So it's a different world from then. Um, but my conclusion there is pretty much the same, which is that quality projects will win, and the scale of power will determine which of the quality projects are chosen for each place. So what I mean is General Electric Hitachi has what seems to be a sensible 300 megawatt design. 300 megawatts is going to be the right size for a lot of folks. And there's going to be both political and economic reasons why uh, companies and countries are going to want 300 megawatt 
units of power either spread around to satisfy dueling uh, industrial groups, for example, or to fit into existing operations with the first reactor providing just what's needed for a private owner or providing an easier pill to swallow before Vogel proves to be a one-time situation with large nuclear. So maybe a timing thing uh, in a little bit, but I think that in each size range, there will be winning one or two industrial conglomerates that ju- and so combinations of designers, engineer architects, supply chains that just end up winning, or even consultants that are familiar and comfortable going to a country and saying, look, I've been a part of building that design. I can not assure you that I, we're as good with any other design as we are if you choose to work with me and with that design. I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, and there's going to be some winner take all uh, situations. There's going to be a lot of internal strife, civil wars, people who co identified the dream of nuclear with their private dream of their private company being the solution. There's going to be a really harsh period where uh, people, some are moving forward and some are not. And that's going to be a little bit rough and it's going to lead to a collapse in this sort of unified advanced nuclear narrative, I think. Um, and then I think we're going to see the LMRs come back. Big states who can make big central decisions and put a lot of cash are going to keep going with big LMRs, even if they dabble with some new designs that, and some of them may be genuine breakthroughs in business structure, size versus construction team, quality of the design. I expect to see an industrial ferment happen, but without that stating that SMRs are going to rule the day, I see SMRs continuing to draw talent into the industry talent that may be, then be poached up to the either the winning SMR designs or to the large modular reactors, right? Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a less harsh view in the past, which is all advanced is really stupid and dumb, but it's also saying that advanced is as advanced does, and advanced does in many cases as it's already done, and that means the advantage is going to go in anything that's advanced but not so advanced that we haven't done it yet. That Capable managers will be able to capably, capably manage complicated large designs and also simple smaller designs. We certainly seem to hear that coming from a lot of uh, nations that are exploring nuclear, that they don't want to be the, the test case for uh, a novel nuclear design. Uh, True, but so. then there's going to be uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, where people are saying, why won't somebody risk trying something new in our country? Now, that's the optimist in me thinking. The more conservative engineer says, ooh, I don't know if I like that logic, but that's the that's the way I think that nuclear is going to spread fast, where countries say, are we not special enough to get a new ex- uh, experimental design? Now, it might not happen, but that's the inversion of the pessimism of the past that I think we're going to see more and more, where you don't have to go to a country or to a province in a country and say, hey, we need somebody to be offered up as a sacrifice for this national project. Nope. Instead, it's going to be, hey, we've got five other provinces that want this and they're, they're, they want it now. So if you guys with your better site for nuclear want it, you'd better demand it from us because we're, else we're, we're going to the other side of the country. We're going to see that sort of inversion and not just for the reactors, but also for the waste. We haven't mentioned the waste yet, but here in the final seconds of our podcast, I can say... The waste issue is dying day by day. The existence of engineering solutions is spreading rapidly, like a viral meme which says, oh wait, like Representative uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said, the French recycle, we should just do that. Well, that has its ups and downs. It doesn't solve it, but it also wasn't a big problem. So if the meme solutions spread around, then nuclear waste stops being an important issue for people because you can just say, oh, we'll solve it like they did in Finland or or we can solve it like they did in the Netherlands or we can solve it like they do at the dry cask storage at our existing plants. And then people say, oh, okay, so next step, let's get reactors. So we're going to see that spread as part of this general positive momentum. Okay, so we're going to close any second now, but this uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez moment really caught me off guard. That was an Instagram post, I believe. I think it disappeared, but do you know what the context was? Did it's she still there. Fukushima? Okay. It's still there. She pinned it. It's one of her featured, her Japan trip with, I don't know, 60 slides or something is still right. there on her Instagram. Okay. And do you know anything more about that trip? Was it particularly to visit Fukushima or was it more Japan? 
It was uh, Japan. And generic. for her, the okay. highlight was the trains. She always wanted to go see the trains, which I get it. Right. I always get a, a, a limited use train pass, seven day train pass whenever I go to Japan. I just adore it. I love it so much. But uh, for her though, she made public her internal decision-making on whether to go to Fukushima Daiichi. And she explained that the more she learns, the better she feels. And nobody can say that and then celebrate the quality of work being done at the cleanup site and be anti new It just doesn't go together, nor is she willing to come right out and say, I love nuclear and think it should be part of our uh, energy mix. No, that's like five years from now or something. Or if she feels left behind or whatever, but she doesn't, she doesn't have to lead on pro-nuclear sentiment, but she is a crucial mop-up force for the left saying, here's the line of acceptable discourse on nuclear. If you're behind me, who's saying, oh, I'm still cautious, I'm not sure, I'm learning more facts and science to make up my mind about whether nuclear is a good thing, but I'm keeping it open and maybe we do nuclear, but not sure yet. That is now the line of accepting of, a, of acceptable nuclear pessimism on the left in the U.S. And anybody to the other side is a weird old doomer boomer. Yeah. And they're on their way out after, you know, destroying their own state's power supplies, of course, in the Northeast case, but still better than never. Yeah. That is that sweep up operation we can expect to continue because it's occurring still during cleanup and bad news stories coming out of Japan with their triple meltdown and with nuclear plants being caught up in war in Ukraine, still yeah. that mop-up operation is moving. But yeah, when you bring it back to the situation as Zaporizhia, it is pretty extraordinary the way the narrative has shifted. Um, Mark, we're going to have to cut it off somewhere. I think now's uh, as good a time as any. Um, looking forward to uh, you coming back. We've got some more master classes scheduled with you. Um, Uranium, the people are clamoring for it. Um, so hopefully we'll get that scheduled soon. Thanks for making the time today. And uh, we will catch you on the flip side. Good to be here, Chris.